David and Jacko, The Janitor and the Serpent, by David Downey. The Battle of the Insects The praying mantis and the spider looked at each other, seemingly with hatred. The mantis had spiked claws that could pierce the skin of its prey and hold it while the mantis fed. The spider had two clearly visible fangs, at least to an interested boy like me, that dripped glistening venom, which would both paralyze and dissolve flesh, allowing the spider to effectively drink its victim alive. I waited for one or the other to strike first as they were mere inches apart. Nothing happened. Come on, you fellas! I yelled, attack! Still, nothing happened. I pushed the spider closer with a stick until it touched the right claw of the mantis. Instinctively, the claw snapped shut, causing the spider to writhe in distress and bite helplessly into the air. Yeah, I yelled to no one in particular. I picked up the long line of spider silk that the spider had woven before my arrival. It went right up to its behind, which jerked into the air along with the mantis, which was still attached to the spider, as I pulled the silk upwards. For one glorious moment, the mantis held the spider high in its claw, its back legs stretched before I let go of the silk, causing the mantis to fall and smash the spider's head face first into the ground. Body slam, I yelled, this time to my dog. The spider's legs wriggled helplessly as the mantis stared on silently. What do you reckon, Jacko? I asked my little dog. An Australian terrier. He just lay there, unimpressed. Although when I looked at him a little longer, his tail started whacking the bricks as if to say hello. I scratched him on the head and under his chin the way he liked it. I pushed his little ears back too as I knew he couldn't scratch himself there. Jack's tail was really thumping now. And I picked him up and scratched his belly. He was my little mate. By now, the mantis was sucking almost lovingly on the spider's belly. Judging by its increasingly desperate movements, the spider didn't seem to be loving it as much. But I didn't blame it, as I could see its belly getting smaller and smaller by the minute. It was then my mother called me in for lunch. The kitchen and the omelet. I walked in the front door, which was never locked, and into the lounge room. I could see Mum in the kitchen putting the blender together. What's for lunch, Mum? I inquired. Sweet omelet, she replied as she cracked an egg into the blender before putting in some milk and plain flour. Yay, I said, because sweet omelet was my favorite. Mum cooked her mixture into something that looked like a pancake before putting sugar and lemon juice on it, rolling it up, and putting more sugar and lemon juice on it. Mmm, it was the tastiest thing she could cook. And tasty it was. No hairs. Unlike last time. And not burnt, either. I sat on the couch and started eating it with my knife and fork as I peered through the wall into the backyard. About three meters of the wall had been missing ever since Dad announced he was going to build a new one and knock the old one out with a hammer. That was five years ago, but I didn't mind the hole in the wall at all. It was handy for running down to the backyard and was especially good in winter because it let some cold air in so we could use the fireplace. It was too hot otherwise. What are you up to this afternoon, Davy? Mom asked. She was one of only a few people I let call me that. I told her I was going out for a bike ride with Jack. Be careful, she said. You know those children from school are still missing. People have no idea what happened to them. It could be anything. Boring, I said before darting out the side of the house, grabbing my bike and making for the street. Little Jacko's legs worked hard to run after me. I didn't like those kids anyway. Slitherings in the park. I rode down the road past my friend's house and took a left onto the path between my street and the next. It was a shortcut, really, and there were annoying crossbars along the way designed to slow down people like me on bikes or perhaps to stop people on motorbikes altogether. I tried to hacksaw them off once, but it was too hard. Past the last crossbar, I waved at the policeman who lived on the last house on the right before the next road. He marched me to my parents one day when I was having a flower fight next to his house on my 10th birthday. Today, he just clenched his fist and waved at me. Jacko scooted across the road, not paying as much attention as he should. I followed him on my bike, checking the traffic on both sides as my mother had taught me long ago. We kept going down the path on the other side of the road, down to the deli, where I bought our bread every day or so. I asked Jack to sit outside the store before wandering in and buying a chocolate frog for five cents, which was change my grandmother had let me keep after buying me some fake blood for my birthday. I sat in the park next to the shop and munched on my frog. Jack had noticed a crow in the long grass about ten meters away and was poised to charge when all of a sudden it squawked, no, screamed, the most blood-curdling squawk 
walk a crow has ever made, and promptly fell over dead. Jack and I bolted over to the dead crow, eyes bulging. There were two puncture wounds on its belly. Something slithered close by, but I couldn't catch what it was before it disappeared into the grass. Weird, I thought, before knocking off the rest of my frog and jumping back onto my bike. The disgusting school and the missing chicken. I rode past the bamboo at the end of the car park, past the house where the crazy lady lived, and on up towards the Jamboree Heights State School. It was named after a scout gathering which had been held the year I was born in the park where the crow screamed. It had to be in the running for the most disgusting school on earth. It was built next to both a sewage plant and a garbage dump. Why would adults choose to build a school in such a location, I thought. The stench was sometimes paralyzing. One little boy even had to go to the hospital after vomiting too much. Jacko didn't like the school either, particularly because he'd been locked up a number of times by the cruel janitor, Mr. Sniggles, along with a number of other children Mr. Sniggles thought had misbehaved. They all had to sit together in a little cage until it was time to go home. I left my bike at the bike rack. We moved as quietly as we could behind the music building and towards the fence at the side of the school. While it was the weekend, you never could be sure who would be lurking around. Thinking the path was clear, we crept down the fence line towards the playground. After a minute or so, we came across an old woman with white hair who was watering her garden on the other side of her fence. Have you seen my chicken? She asked in a quiet voice. I'm sorry, I said. You're what? My chicken! Have you seen my chicken? She screamed. She stared at me with her crazy eyes. I started running away towards the playground. She's nuts, I said to Jack. We arrived at the playground. And I scampered up the wooden fort, climbed up the ropes, and using the ladder attached to its side. <sighs> Jacko stood down at the bottom and looked up, wagging his tail. From the top of the fort, I was able to look right across the school. There was the oval where they made us play sports and do laps. Up the hill slightly were the classrooms. And beyond that, the big old tree that was used for backyard cricket. And the spot where we played marbles. There was also the old hut where Mr. Sniggles, the janitor, was supposed to live. Although, I'd only ever seen him walking around the school, scowling. I, uh, I couldn't see any chicken. Jacko barked. It was a soft bark. The sort of bark he barks when he wants me to hear him, but nobody else. I looked down. He first looked up at me and then towards a big pipe that was in the playground for children to crawl through at lunchtime. What's up, mate? I called out. Jacko just barked some more softly, and managed to look excited and scared at the same time. I moved down the side of the fort and started lowering myself down. Soon I was on the ground with my little friend who came over and licked me on my face. What's up, mate? I said again. Did you see something? He gave me an imploring look that was also one of caution, and so I inched my way slowly towards the big pipe that seemed to have his attention. I was clearly going in the right direction as Jacko was now looking intently at it and wouldn't move his head even if I called his name. We came up to the back of the pipe. It was large and dark. So dark I could only see a little way in. Although I felt scared, I felt I had no choice but to explore. So I started crawling on my hands and knees with Jacko walking reluctantly in front of me. A few feet in, he started to whimper softly. I had not heard that before. It was pitch black. Jack. You okay, mate? I asked him again. He didn't answer. I felt out into the dark exploring for Jacko's fur coat. At first it was more concrete. Then, but, ugh, bubblegum, which was disgusting. Then something even more disgusting than bubblegum, followed by some sharp stones, and then something scaly. It, I took a double take. Something scaly? It wasn't moving, but it was rough to touch and cold. It was wide and round, like a very big log but covered with scales and coming to a thinner tip at the end, like some sort of tail. I pulled back my hand for a second, then remembered Jacko and put it back into the black. I found the scales and then worked my way up around the edge to where the scales stopped. At that point, my fingers ran into fur and the familiar shape of Jack's little head. He was shivering. It's okay, mate, I whispered. Let's get out of here. I reached in with my other hand to grab him and to work my way backwards, but before I could do it, the scales moved. The tail, if that's what it was, moved. It started moving away from me. I could feel it go under my fingers. And it took Jacko with it. Panicked, I grabbed the end of the tail just as it was getting out of my reach. I was hoping to stop it, but it was so big and I was so small. I was just dragged along behind it into the darkness. 
Mr. Sniggle's dinner. I was dragged along the bottom of the pipe into the dark for what seemed an eternity before coming out into the late afternoon sunlight. The first thing I saw was Jacko, who was still in front of me, huddled and shivering. The second thing I saw was the end of a massive snake I was holding on to. It was ginormous. It was the biggest creature I had ever seen, except for elephants. It must have been as long as three cars and twice as big as fat Uncle Graham's belly in width. Bigger even. It didn't seem to notice Jacko or me. We were too little. It just slithered its way along the grass out of the playground and towards the school buildings. It slithered its way up the little hill past the principal's office and towards Mr. Sniggles' hut, or at least the hut where everyone thought Mr. Sniggles lived. I kept holding on. I had to, for Jacko. I couldn't see the back of the snake's head very well from where I was, but I knew it could swallow each of us for morning tea without a second's thought. I wasn't going to let my mate Jack get eaten by a snake, even a snake as large as this one. So I kept holding on, even as I was dragged over more rocks and stones and other unspeakables in the playground. It was quite clear to me now that if Mr. Sniggles did live in that hut, then he was in for a nasty surprise. The giant snake headed straight for his door. I wanted to call out to warn him not to come out, but I didn't want to draw the snake's attention to us. Not even cruel Mr. Sniggles deserved to be eaten by a snake. The snake arrived at his front door and paused for a moment. I took advantage of this to let go of its tail and grab Jacko, who was still cowering in shock. I was considering which direction to run when something unexpected happened. The snake slithered through the door. Not through the door exactly, but through a door in the door. A snake door. It's all it could have been. It was too big for a cat door. It was too small for a human door. But it seemed to fit the snake perfectly. This led me to only one conclusion. Either the snake lived by itself in the hut that we all thought was Mr. Sniggles' hut, or, more likely, it lived with Mr. Sniggles. It was Mr. Sniggles' snake. I quickly moved up to the side of the hut, Jacko under one arm, to take a peek into Mr. Sniggles' window. He was there, all right. A beast of a man, with a big bushy beard that looked more complicated than a bird's nest although he obviously solved its mysteries often enough to eat well, as he had the belly to prove it, and various food stains and leftover blobs of ugh, who knows what on his shirt. Mr. Sniggles was a mess, but he was a mess with a pet snake. I could hear him talking to it. So, Snooky, what have you brought me for dinner today? He bellowed, with his belly wobbling and his beard shaking. Food scraps fell onto the floor as he spoke. Ugh. I took a good look at the snake for the first time, which had wrapped itself into a coil, but still took up half the room. Bigger than I guessed. It had a huge diamond head and a mouth that could easily accommodate both Jacko and me. A long red tongue forked into at the end, slithered out every 15 seconds or so. Ugh, gave me the heebie-jeebies. I said, what have you brought me for dinner? Screamed Mr. Sniggles. I wonder what Mr. Sniggles expected the snake to have brought him for dinner, especially as it had no arms. Unless... He meant us. The snake raised its head until it was level with Mr. Sniggles' head. For a moment, I thought that Mr. Sniggles was going to end up to be dinner instead, until I saw a football-sized shape halfway down the snake's belly. The snake's body contorted, the way you or I might contort if we were about to throw up some bad food we had just eaten, except the contortions in the snake went on and on, and his body rolled and rolled with them, pushing the mysterious shape up as it did. Eventually, the shape reached the top of the snake's body, and with an audible crack, the snake dislocated his jaw and opened his mouth wider than I thought possible. Then a chicken appeared. A whole chicken. Then the snake made a noise a human might think of as a rude burp, and the chicken flew across the room and onto the table. A chicken? screamed Mr. Sniggles. I said a fat child, not a chicken. The snake didn't seem to care what Mr. Sniggles said and settled back down into its coil for a sleep. Whatever am I to do, muttered Mr. Sniggles. A chicken isn't enough. No, not for the likes of me it isn't. I must have some more. More, more, more! A chicken won't do! No, not at all! Mr. Sniggles walked around and around in circles, rubbing his belly as he talked to himself. I'll tell you what, Sneaky, I will go out and buy some ingredients to go with the chicken and you can go and get some more meat properly this time, a nice fat child. There are plenty of those to choose from. The last one was skin and bones. 
We need some nice fat for rendering in the pan. Yes, we do. The snake opened up one eye as Mr. Sniggles spoke. Perhaps he understood what was going on. Yes, I'll go now, Snakey. Off to get garlic and rosemary and white wine and olives. They will go well with those cherry tomatoes, they will. And you will get me a fat child. And we will render the fat and have nice child and chicken stew. Yes, we will. With olives and cherry tomatoes and salt. Always plenty of salt. Perhaps some chili flakes. I was now the one in shock, and Jacko started comforting me by licking my hand. Mr. Sniggles was cooking and eating the children. And they were being hunted by a giant snake. I was horrified. Mr. Sniggles gathered his things and opened his door to go out shopping. The snake, that did seem to understand after all, followed him through his snake door, presumably looking for a child like me for Mr. Sniggles' dinner. Hopefully I wasn't fat enough. I didn't want to find out, though, so Jacko and I crept around the other side of the house to avoid the snake. Before too long, we were past the front door and about to head back home through the school gate, but then we saw the snake. It had stopped and was slowly raising its head into the air. Its forked tongue darted in and out as though it smelled something it liked. It started to turn back in our direction. We had no choice but to run into the hut through the snake door so it couldn't see us. Mr. Sniggle's hut. The snake door flapped closed behind us. Before we could even get our bearings, we were hit by the smell. A disgusting smell. A smell of rotten flesh and slithering horrors. A smell, perhaps, of chopped up children who met their gruesome ends in a pot tended by a grotesque madman with a tangled beard and giant belly. Both Jacko and I gagged involuntarily, ugh, fighting back the urge to spew. I didn't know dogs could gag. Hmm. The hut was not much bigger than my living room back at home. There was a corner where the snake coiled, which was relatively clean except for some old snakeskin piled up in a heap. A partially digested chicken was on the table in the middle of the room, along with a wooden spoon and sharp-looking chef's knife. I was not sure, but it looked as though the chicken's face was frozen in a final expression of horror. The sort of expression a chicken would have when it realized it was being eaten alive and about to be digested by a, a giant snake. There was a stove on one side of the hut, wood-fired. A giant pot sat over the hot plate. If this wasn't dinner for Mr. Sniggles, then I wasn't sure what it might be. Perhaps it was a child stock he kept adding scraps to that never stopped simmering. Curious, even in my fear, I crept towards the stove and pulled the lid off the giant pot. Ugh, to my relief. There were just vegetables in there I recognized, like carrots and onions and bay leaves, and even some celery sticks. Hmm, perhaps Mr. Sniggles was just mentally deranged, I thought, and had a pet snake and a vivid imagination. Sure, there were some bones and meat in there, but they could well be chicken, just like the one the snake delivered up earlier. Ah, it must be chicken stock for making soups and the like. I, I lifted the giant lid to put it back on the pot when... Something new popped to the surface of the liquid. It was all white, like an egg. Perhaps the chicken had an egg in it, I thought. Or Mr. Sniggles had lost his marbles and makes his stock with eggs as well. Except the egg was peeled. It made no sense. I stood up on my tippy toes to get a closer look at the egg. It was right in the middle of the pot next to a carrot. The egg turned over as the pot simmered. It was an eye! A child's eye! Oh, I dropped the stocklet in horror, which made a loud clanging noise. Jacko started barking, whether in excitement or fear. I couldn't tell. We were in trouble. I took a look outside the window near the door. The snake was only a minute or so away from the hut, and its huge frame was slithering right towards us with some determination. In panic, I looked around the room for somewhere to hide. Jacko was barking loudly now, no doubt making the snake slither even faster. Jack, me, shut the hell up, I whispered, eyes flickering back and forth. I could hear the snake now. It must have been only meters away. Crap, I said to myself softly, even though I knew it wasn't a word I shouldn't use. The snake door started to open now, slowly, as though the snake was being cautious. It was too late. We'd run out of time. Jacko and I were about to be eaten alive. Into the belly of the beast. Panicked. 
I grabbed the chef's knife from the table next to the corpse of the terrified chicken and considered my options. There was no way I could win a fair fight against the snake. Each of its fangs was larger than my knife, and it probably weighed ten times as much as me. Little Jacko's teeth wouldn't have even pierced its skin. I knew I had to take desperate steps if either of us was going to survive. Jacko, mate, do you trust me? I said. Jack looked at me quizzically as I pulled the old snake skin over me and hid in the corner. Mate, I'm sorry. You're just going to have to trust me. Try and hold your breath and avoid the fangs. Jack's eyes widened as though he understood what I said. He didn't have much time to consider the implications, though, because at that moment the snake's massive copper head appeared in the doorway and immediately focused on my little friend. Jack immediately went into shock, like he did in the pipe. From my hiding place under the snakeskin, I could see his little body shaking. He cowered to the ground as the snake made its way through the door. It just seemed to keep coming meter after meter until its whole massive frame was in the hut. Little Jack had stopped shaking. He appeared to be playing dead. At least I hoped he was playing. Perhaps he had passed out from shock. The snake inched its way closer to Jack's body. I clutched my knife, trying to work out if I could do something that wouldn't result in us both being killed. The snake's jaw popped as it dislocated a second time. Slowly, torturously, it wrapped its mouth around my little dog. First his little tail, his back legs, and his little belly, before finally, horrifically, his little head disappeared into the darkness without so much as a whimper. I knew I didn't have much time, but I had to wait. The snake was working at moving Jacko down to its lower belly. As his body rippled and contorted, I could see my little friend shuffling down his digestive tract. Ten seconds passed. Twenty. If things didn't quickly proceed as I hoped, then I was in real trouble. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the snake rested its massive head on the ground and closed its eyes. It was having a siesta in order to digest my dog. I carefully pushed the old snake skin aside and crept up to the sleeping snake. Its tongue slithered in and out as it breathed. I lifted the chef's knife high. This is for my dog, you revolting reptile, whispered, before jumping into the air and using all my body weight slammed into the snake's head. Knife first. The blade cracked the snake's skull and embedded into its brain before it had a chance to open its mouth. I quickly pulled the knife out and ignored the brain news as I searched for the lump where my jacko was. Hang in there, mate, I cried cutting into the beast's skin. Within moments, I could see little Jack's face. It was wet and covered with snake goo that got all over my hands as I pulled his little body out. Mate, are you still with me? I wiped the goo off as best I could and put my ear against his little chest. I killed him, mate. It's over. I killed the bastard. I, I could hear a heartbeat. He was alive! I massaged his little head, scratching him the way he liked. I called his name some more, tickled his belly, and did what I could to bring him back from his deep state of shock. His eyes opened, and he blinked. Welcome back, mate. It's over. It was then I heard Mr. Sniggle's voice from outside the door. Mr. Sniggle's comeuppance. Sneaky! Sneaky! I have the garlic sneaky and the wine and the olives. It will be delicious sneaky sneaky. His voice boomed through the door as Jack and I sat by the dead snake, wondering how we were going to survive a second onslaught. Mr. Sniggles was a huge, beastly man. I was only a small child. Poor Jack was still in shock from being eaten alive by a snake. I tried to think of something clever. Mr. Sniggles had gotten out his key and was working on the lock. Bloody keys, he muttered. It sounded like he dropped them. Desperate, I grabbed the dead chicken with its permanent face of horror from the table, went to the snake's massive mouth, and wrenched it open. Two enormous fangs glistened with drops of venom. I rubbed the chicken all over them, and then pushed the fangs right back into its body. Over and over, milking the giant beast of its poison the way I had seen someone do in a zoo. I paused to wipe the brain goo off the snake's head before putting the chicken back on the table and grabbing up Jacko in my arms. Sorry, mate, I said. We're going back in. I crawled into the snake's body through the cut I had made to rescue Jacko, just as the door burst open. Snakey! I'm back, Snakey! Mr. Snickles surveyed the room suspiciously. What are you up to, Snakey? He peered at the lump in the snake's belly, which was right where we were hiding. Excellent, he said. 
I can see by the size that you've caught me a tasty child, and now you're having a well-earned rest. When you wake up, we can share the second course. Kitty, all orange. Back at his table, he took the horrified chicken and cut it into parts before putting it in a pan on the stove. As he did so, he sang a little song. Oh, chicken, my chicken, you mean the world to me. Oh, chicken, my chicken, have some rosemary. He chuckled at his own wit, which caused his belly to jig up and down and food to fall from his beard onto the floor. Ugh. He took a long swig from his bottle of wine before tipping a bit of that into the pan and putting on the lid. There we go, my chicken. There we go, my chicken, he whispered before taking another slurp of the wine. Meanwhile, Jacko and I were huddled in the belly of the beast. It was dark. It was rank. It was putrid. But we were still alive, and we just had to wait until Mr. Sniggles had eaten some chicken. If only we weren't so exhausted. Half an hour later, the clink of the lid woke us as Mr. Sniggles tended to his chicken. It was tender now and surrounded by black olives and just burst tomatoes. Mmm, said Mr. Sniggles as he tasted the sauce, serving himself a huge helping. He moved over to the table and sat down with a loaf of bread and a knife and fork. Beautiful chicken, said Mr. Sniggles as he ate the tenderest part. We watched him through the crack in the snake's skin. If it was going to work, it would work now. Otherwise, it would be us in the pan with the rosemary. We had to wait a little longer, I thought to myself. Then Jacko sneezed. I clutched him tightly, holding his mouth shut. He looked guilty. I waited silently for what seemed like forever until I parted the snake's skin just a little to take a look. Mr. Sniggle stared at me from where he stood right next to the snake. What have we here? He bellowed angrily. He pulled the snake's skin aside and grabbed me by my hair, wrenching me out of the belly and onto the floor. Jacko flung out of my arms and hit the wall before sliding onto the floor, dazed. What have you done to my snake? He screamed right in my face. His breath stank of liver and guts and blood and rosemary, which was really quite unsettling. Small bits of food sprayed out of his beard as he yelled, which was even more disgusting. You're going into the stock pot, he cried, and picked me up again by my hair and walked me over to the pot. There was only one way I would have fit in, and that was if I wasn't in one piece. He used his free hand to hold up the chef's knife. Prepare yourself, he whispered, and moved to bring the knife down on my hand. Suddenly, he cried out in pain, and Jacko's snarl could be heard from the floor. I looked down, and Jack had come to life and was giving him the ankle biting of a lifetime. Get off me, he screamed letting go of me to kick Jack into the wall again. No, you've really got me mad, he said, holding the knife even higher. I shut my eyes and prepared to be chopped into pieces for the stock pot. At least I tried to prepare myself. I waited some more, and some more, then I opened one eye. Mr. Sniggles was still holding the knife, but he was quickly twitching back and forth like a grotesque hummingbird, and white foam started frothing from his lips and dripped into his beard and its filth. His eyes rolled into the back of his head. Eat too much chicken? I asked, feeling both clever and relieved. Mr. Sniggles' twitches got bigger and bigger and more and more frantic until his arms and legs were flailing around in what could have been a perverse voodoo dance. The chef's knife flung out of his hand and stuck tip first into the wall. Mr. Sniggles' mouth opened slightly and he groaned slowly as he jigged. Clearly, the massive dose of snake venom was working its way through his body. The groan increased in intensity until it became a loud, ghoulish moan that got louder and louder and louder until it hurt my ears. Then it stopped, and he was still. He looked straight at me, white froth dripping from his putrid beard onto his still wobbling stomach. You, child, he rasped, are a murderer. Then he screamed a scream that no janitor should be able to scream. It was low and then high and then every pitch all together until it filled the hut and filled my head and Jacko wailed in distress with him. Lesions appeared on Mr. Sniggle's face. The venom was breaking down his flesh. His unholy moan continued as the lesions grew, revealing muscle and then the bones of his skull. Still, he wailed. He wailed as his body drooped and shrank and the very flesh dripped off him onto the floor. He wailed and wailed until he was half my size, and he still wailed, although it got softer and sadder the more he shrank. Eventually, he collapsed into a bucket full of mush and a pile of bones in the middle of the hut next to the dead snake. The wailing stopped. 
I looked at Jacko, and he looked at me. Bloody hell, I said. That was theatrical. Home. I rode my bike back into the driveway. Jack followed behind. He stopped at the tap outside of the house, just past the driveway, his tongue lapping up drops of water as they dripped down. His tongue had a little black birthmark on it, which I'd never noticed before. David! called my mother. You're just in time for dinner! Wash your hands! I walked down the side of the house and through the sliding door. We were eating at a table Dad had bought that was too big for the room, just off the kitchen. He never wanted to admit that it was too big, though, so he refused to get rid of it. We sat huddled as a family at the oversized table. Mom walked over carrying some plates and started serving. What is it? I asked hopefully. Chicken, she said with a smile. Jacko and I looked at each other again and grimaced.